You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for December 3rd, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the cornfield resistance where the leaves have fallen, the lawn is mulched, the butter cow is long gone, and women's reproductive rights remain sacrosanct. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Move to Illinois, people. Move to Illinois, I tell you. What, <laughs> I kind of... I, I want to say that as a as a matter of a, a welcoming committee of yeah. refugees, but <clears throat> I also fear emptying out the red states. Yeah, to the point where each of them has a population equivalent to Wyoming. Yeah, but they all have two senators. Right, and and later on in the show, I have a conversation with Junior Dude about mm -hmm. the Illinois uh, congressional map. The new map came out last week, and we couldn't do we couldn't record Thanksgiving week. Uh, uh, to talk about it, but uh, he points that out in the interview that I did with him. That yeah. uh, in order to have democratic districts, it, democratic legislatures have to cram Republicans, more and more Republicans, into smaller districts, right. which makes them more lopsided. Which means that Democrats mm -hmm. are actually contributing, and you know this is how it goes, right? It's always bad news for Biden, and let's blame Democrats, right? But Democrats. Democratic gerrymandering actually leads to safer districts for Republicans. That's true. So because you crammed all the Republicans into these three or four districts, they wind up being R plus 50, right. you know, because right. you've concentrated them. But and, and so and, then a Republican can go off and say and do shut down the government right. <laughs> over vaccines like they're trying to do because they're in a completely and utterly safe seat at all well, times. Right? And, and just under that is the is the knowledge that shutting the government down because you hate Joe Biden is a perfectly legitimate thing to do in the Republican Party. Right. That right. It, won't, it won't cost you anything to behave like a Except lunatic. Except that it does. And that's what Mitch McConnell knows. Yes. He yes, has it does. finally learned that, oh, no, we get blamed for shutdowns. And the reason you get blamed for shutdowns is because... Your members, Mitch McConnell, dance around like fairies and <laughs> joyous angels, you know, every time the government's shut down. This is so great. This we is great. We wanted to do this. This and is so Ted Cruz. Though, yeah. No discipline in your caucus. You're, you, he finally said, no, we're not going to do this. We're not going to shut down the government. He's learned, He's been burned enough times to know that is one thing that actually the American people, and to a certain extent, the Beltway Press does blame Republicans right. for. Because every, every time they hold a microphone out to a member of the Freedom Caucus, they're dancing about it. Burn it all down. Burn it down. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I do want to mention one thing about Junior Dude that is just slightly, not unrelated, but I found to be adorable, which mm -hmm. was when the new maps came out, he oh, was yeah. all over the house like a uh, some guy in Hollywood selling maps to the stars homes, you know, <laughs> want to buy a map, want to buy a map. You want to see the map? I got the map right here. Like, okay, I'm kind of, I'm putting a, a I'm trying to tighten some screws over here. No. Well, okay. In a minute, but these maps are amazing. You should really check these maps out. Yeah. And he, his like, sister came home from work and she's exhausted. And she, he says, you got to see this new map. <laughs> <laughs> Which like, I, I think is, I think it's terrific. I think it's yeah. just terrific. He has a lot of enthusiasm. He and, does. Yeah. But yeah, I'm trying to get the turkey in the oven. Yeah. <laughs> junior dude yeah. but you got to see the new map yeah but it's, it's amazing oh my god do you see what they did at the 13th like yeah, yeah. okay oh. all right so we'll get we to it give him an opportunity on the podcast uh at the end to talk about uh the new maps yes. so uh we've got to talk about the abortion situation yes. in the supreme court yes and uh i just keep coming back to hey republicans be very careful what you wish for yeah you may get your wish on this, but oh my gosh, are you going to infuriate suburban white women? Mm -hmm. And uh, forever, forever. Um, and I'm kind of impressed, actually, with how much the right 
is completely showing their hands on this. Um, not just Amy Comey Barrett coming out and say, well, you know, you carry a baby for nine months and just give it up. Why not? Just you know, drop that's it off not a burden. High. Don't they have a, a bin for that at Hy-Vee yeah, next right. to the recycling? Yeah, just <laughs> drop your baby off. store right sure. next to the plastic bags, right? Sure. You just drop yeah. off your kid. No. Uh, and and then uh, last night, Laura Ingram, and this is up at Crooks and Liars, said, look, we bought and paid for these SCOTUS judges. Right. They better do what we want. I'm pissed off about this. Yeah, we bought them fair and, and square. And we're going we're to yep. rearrange the court if they don't do exactly what we paid them to do. That's right. I'm glad she's saying that. It, and it, she name-checked the Federalist Society yeah. on air. Right. That's how we... And and that's the part that's kind of um, a little bit bracing, but also a little bit like shrugging if, you've, if you're on the left. It's like, we, we, know, we know this. We've known this for decades. They've mm-hmm. outsourced the entire process because they need the judiciary to stay. Mm-hmm. Uh, to to stay far right wing, they need to they need to jam it up so that it's not going to change lifetime appointments right, right. for decades. So for they can decades, right. so that when all the old farts die off and people and people start to notice how badly fucked they are from Republican policies, there's no way to fix it. They have jammed the door open because they fill the courts with lunatics who will uphold the craziest decisions you can imagine for the next. 30, 40 years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's the plan. And Mitch McConnell knows that he's, you know, not going to be long for this earth and he wants his legacy to be, uh, you know, this is, this actually has a little bit to do with, with uh, critical race theory, which is mm-hmm. these are the dying Confederacy. Yeah. We yeah. want to embed in the American project institutions that will carry on their depraved legacy after they're dead. Mm-hmm. And that's what housing is like in this country. That's what small business administration has been like. All the institutions in this country that are racist and have racist outcomes were put in place to keep a status quo intact. And that's exactly what Mitch McConnell is doing. It's a pure conservative move. Mm -hmm. We know the country really doesn't like us. And we know they're going to hate what we're going to do to the place. But we're going to jam up the the machinery of government to the point where you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. It's like like Bush going to Iraq. Once you're in, you're screwed. There's no right. way out. You're never coming out. So right. once right. I once I've lied us into this war I wanted to do, I can throw up my hands and say, "Well, what are you going to do about it? You're going to get us out? Really? There's no. I've left you no exit route. I've left you no way to undo the damage I've done. So now you have to compete on my ground. Now you have to do what I say, and that's what they're headed. And this is I don't. You're right. I don't think they've they have calculated how incredibly. They I haven't want to calculated say, how many women have had abortions. Yeah, yeah, and and see that in their life as a point at which they made a financial and you know career choice for their futures. Uh huh. And don't want to talk about it because it's private. And so you know, it's your medical decision. It's like infertility treatment, or cancer treatment, or any other medical situation where you may not want to talk about it with everybody. Right, exactly. And so the fact that you don't want to talk about it doesn't mean it's not a part of your personal history. One out of four women, at least in this mm-hmm. country, have had one. And if you haven't seen the um, Cecily Strong uh, yeah. abortion riff Saturday on SNL, Night Live. it's right. very good. It's, it wasn't funny, but it was funny, but it wasn't funny. But it wasn't funny. It was you very know, clown good. Clown abortions. Clown you abortions. Know, all, my, all my friends have had clown abortions. Yeah. And we all of a sudden realize we've all had clown abortions. And we sit around and realize, oh my gosh, we're all right. We've survived everything and got a career and had kids later and made a decision about our life. And it turned out okay. Because well, and- we had the right. We had our constitutional rights. Well, and that's why Nikki Haley and Laura Ingram and mm-hmm. Amy Comey Barrett uh, are, and people like that, uh, Sarah Palin, are terribly important to the right. Yeah. Because they are women who are willing to become the go-to spokespeople for anti, anti-women, anti-rights mm-hmm. programs. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, the, they're the same reason that there was a, you know, Michael Steele standing in front of the racist party. Mm-hmm. The, the right can mm-hmm. say, look, we got a woman. See that woman over there? She's a, she's a lady. She has lady parts, and she says abortion is evil. Ha ha! Mm-hmm. Touche, mm-hmm. liberal. So yeah. we don't need to have this argument anymore because we have women who are willing to suck up the bullets uh, for for this uh, incredibly evil decision on our part. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it gives them. I mean, and of course, you know, the right turns to women for nothing. 
They give right. them nothing. So this is the one thing where they get Except to be out front. Sing- sentimental it, women that are too old to have kids right. and are sentimental about babies. Yeah. Are a source of money and single issue voting for that party. And, that and was, you and I both saw um, Mrs. America, the mm-hmm. Phyllis Schlafly story. Phyllis Schlafly, yeah. And the, the very end, I think it was the last episode where she finally figures out that the only thing that they care about is her mailing list. Yep. yep. And that th- she was, and she was, they were, pr- the, the right was perfectly willing to let her whip up the women to defeat the ERA. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. But in the end, all the boys shut her out. Mm-hmm. That yeah. she was just a fucking useful idiot. And she finally figured out the, at the end of her. She was there to make coffee yeah. in the end. At the Literally. end of her yeah. miserable, racist life, she figured out that she had been utterly used by these people. And that's hopefully how, you know, Sarah Palin will, will discover well, that. I could on go her on for an chair. hour about Sarah Palin and yeah. reproductive rights and so forth, because she considered abortion and her behavior at the time that her last child was born was clearly, in my personal opinion, dangerous mm-hmm. to the fetus, to the yep. unborn child. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she knew that something was unfortunately wrong with that child, that that's the her last child had down syndrome and uh she made choices that i'm sure were very difficult but she also made choices that were brazen and she talked about it and there are speeches that she gave that she thought were not published in private Mm -hmm. about traveling to texas and it would have been so easy to terminate the pregnancy and she confesses to the audience that she was considering doing it Mm -hmm. and uh because she had a choice i mean but well, she, she made a choice, and that's the point. No one's trying to take away Sarah Palin's choice in those matters. No, and she was perfectly willing to haul that infant out on stage at on every stage, convention. Over and, and over again. Like a sack of potatoes and say, yeah. see, I'm the mom here. I'm. Yeah. You can trust me. I'm the mom. I can speak for moms everywhere. And, yeah. you know, the right will use you up and well, spit and, you out. And her pregnant daughter, out of wedlock yeah. pregnant daughter as well. Yeah. And and put a suit on that jackass that got her pregnant mm-hmm. and pretend it's OK because she didn't have an abortion. So, you know, we're all we're all right with this. Everyone in this room has a daughter or niece or somebody who got pregnant out of wedlock. And as long as you don't have an abortion, it's fine. Well, um, let's pivot from extremely maternal conservatives to manly men of the right. Uh, specifically, like Chris, Chris, like Chris Christie. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Chris well, Christie. Nick Cersei had a lot to say about abortion today on Twitter. I know. He, oh blocks you and and you know whatever but he he thought it was just terrible that um whoopi goldberg left men out of the reproductive equation Mm -hmm. and it's like (laughs) really nick nick if you could get pregnant there would be abortion clinics at every walmart in the country yes it would be part of your sag after contract nick (laughs) (laughs) yeah um no, let, let's talk about an even more manly man, and that's Chris Christie. Um, I, don't, I just don't want to pass over what uh-huh. happened at SCOTUS yesterday. No, no, we, um, we, we must not. And, and and how horrible it is. And I know there are people out there feeling very stressed about it. And yeah, I get it. Uh, we may lose Roe. And it is up to us then to handle this electorally. There are women in Congress that want... And no, I'm not talking about Susan fucking Collins. No. I'm talking about serious women who have serious plans to uh, make abortion legal in a congressional way. Mm -hmm. Um, It's already been, uh, reproductive freedom has already been legislated into law in Massachusetts and Illinois um, and other states. And uh, if we're going to have this two-tier constitutional right for women... I guarantee you this is going to hurt states. It's going to be just like segregation. It's going to hurt financially, hurt states that go that route, that go the women are not fully full citizens route. Speaking of someone who has two college-age daughters, I can tell you high-performing college-age women are not going to go to college in states where abortion is illegal. Mm Mm-hmm. And that is a long-term death knell for those states economically. Well, and if I may make a suggestion to members of Congress now, Mm -hmm. um, liberal members of Congress, Mm -hmm. um, in the same way that uh, I think it was Charlie Rangel, I'm not sure, who proposed reinstituting the draft. Oh, yeah. um, Just as a matter of, oh, you want, this needs to sting. 
This yeah, war needs right. to sting. So let's let's draft all these all these mouthy Republican young men mm-hmm. who want to fight from behind their keyboards. Right. Um, right. Which is not a policy I support, but that I support the anti-war. attitude. War. He was making right. an anti-war statement. Right. Right. I, I would I would hope that someone in on the on the left in the House would propose cutting off all aid to countries where abortion is legal. Mm-hmm. And watch the pro-Israeli lobby on the right lose their fucking yep. minds. Yep. Because yep. guess where your tax money is going? It's going to Israel where abortions are available on demand. Mm-hmm. And they're taxpayer supported. And it's perfectly okay. And you never hear word fucking one from yep. the right wing, you know, let's all support Israel until the judgment day when, mm-hmm. when we run out of use for it. Right. Um, from the right. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. No, it's a terrible day. It's It's a terrible day. And this, I think I'm stealing from your TV husband here, um, saying that this this was- Ellie Mistel. Ellie Mistel. Um, this case was decided back in 2016. Yep. When Mitch McConnell stole a uh, Supreme Court seat from Barack Obama, got away with it. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. then the right learned, oh, we can get away with anything. We can, we can right. do anything now. And there's no- Because we there's have nothing, the Senate. Sure. There's nothing to stop us. So we can make up a fucking rule about, no, you can't support, and then just reverse that rule- and just take our dicks out and wave it at the press and say, we dare you. We fucking dare you to call us hypocrites because we know we're hypocrites. We just don't care. And you have no ability in your tiny little bubble universe in the Beltway to cope with the fact that we are monsters mm-hmm. and we're happy to be monsters. We like being monsters. Because we get to have power that way. Yeah, yes. That's, right. how, that's the only way we get to have power. Um, right. All right. So you want to talk about Chris Christie. I don't want to, but I feel we have to. <laughs> Um, speaking of creatures that uh, don't have power anymore, um, because Chris Christie is entirely a creation of the Beltway media, um, when his book dropped last week, I think it was, he got the full Gingrich treatment. He was everywhere. He was on we CNBC and MSNBC. Yes, yeah. we did. He was all over the place. And man, they loved him. Everybody but Nicole Wallace was just lathered to have him on their show. He was on podcasts. He was on the radio. He was everywhere. And then his book crashed really hard. Uh, According to Eric Bullard's press run, Christie's book, Republican Rescue, sold just 2,289 copies during its first week in the stores. No one's giving it for Christmas? No, at all. I I believe it is underselling the paperback edition of The Christmas Sweater by Glenn Beck, (laughs) which, you know, surprises no one. Uh, This is a colossal publishing flop. Uh, that figure does not include digital copies of the book, but based on industry sales patterns, given Christie's weak showing in stores, he likely sold only a few hundred digital digital copies. On Sunday, uh, Republican Rescue is ranked 15,545th at Amazon's Kindle store. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. And that's how much actual humans who don't get their money from CBS or NBC or ABC. Or Viacom, right. Or Viacom hate Chris Christie and yeah. don't want to see him ever again. And, and it's and and you know what? He's he's universally hated. The the people who I always have a you know bone of contention with over at the bulwark were like, get him off a of fucking stage. <laughs> like, okay, on this one thing we agree. Now, I disagree because you're willing to let any clown show up at your door and forgive them as long as they use the words Trump is an asshole. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter mm-hmm. how, how long it took them or what they really believe or what's not going to stab you in the back. Your standard is if you show up, you say the right words, you're in, except Chris Christie. So Chris Christie is uniquely hated by everyone and rightly so. So I'm glad to see him crash and burn. I want to um, give big applause to Ilhan Omar this week. Um, for her courage in standing up to Lauren Boebert and the death threats that she's getting uh, on voicemail and she and her staff are, are dealing with over this garbage person. Mm-hmm. Lauren Boebert, you know, like Marjorie Green before her, has zero redeeming qualities. No, that's right. And um, these, these Boebert inspired death threats, uh, I was proud that Ilhan Omar took the time to make the Beltway Press listen to a voicemail Mm -hmm. Um, and playing it at her press conference out loud so that the Beltway Press has to say, has to acknowledge it, that this American person 
mm-hmm. left this kind of message for a sitting congresswoman. Mm-hmm. And felt perfectly and, comfortable doing so. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, using sand and word is a Republican thing. <laughs> I'm well, sorry. Yeah, it is. Yeah. As I tweeted, this is this is what Republicans do. This is how they talk when the microphones are off. This is how t- they this talk. This is how in they the talk diners. when they know they're being recorded. Mm-hmm. When they're talking well, is, to a congressional voicemail. When, when in all those diners out there that mm-hmm. New York Times, mm-hmm. the Washington Post invades and colonizes, when the, the journalists leave, this is how they talk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, you and I listened to the voicemail together, and I looked at you and said, "Well, he's had a little bit of help with from some alcohol to get his courage up." Mm-hmm. And he kept threatening her life four or five times. She's going to die. She's going to die. And then he said, military tribunal. <laughs> That's right. We're going to get you. I know military guys. We're going to get a tribunal. It's going to be great. Right. And you yeah. said, oh, he must have noticed the G.I. Joe dolls on his desk all yeah. of a sudden. Oh, you know? one more thing. There's a with Kung Fu grip. We're going to get you on the tribunals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My military tribunal. Uh-huh. But that doesn't negate. The no. horrifying fear that you would have from a drunk asshole mm-hmm. who clearly hates you to the point of threatening murder mm-hmm. and the likelihood that he owns guns is pretty high. Right. Uh, but he but she forced the Beltway media to acknowledge that this person exists and that this person can be manipulated into doing this by another sitting congresswoman who is a shameful person and should not be there. Right. And uh, that didn't stop uh, the Beltway Press and and the mainstream media from watering it down, from watering that whole thing down into both Mm -hmm. siderism. Mm -hmm. The headline at Axios, until they fixed it because they got (laughs) railed in public. Yes, they did. The initial headline at Axios was, Omar releases profanity-laced voicemail. Yeah. Really? That's the, that's the story. That's the, that's story. the story. She released a profanity release, you know, no no part about it. it's from a Republican mm-hmm. who's inspired by Lauren Boebert. And the New York fucking Times. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how they're going to be referred to on this podcast from now on. Mm-hmm. The New York fucking Times said in the earlier part of this story, Boebert reaches out to Omar after incendiary video escalating a feud. Uh-huh. With the lead, Representative Lauren Boebert made an overture to Representative Ilhan Omar after suggesting that the Muslim lawmaker was a terrorism threat. Mm -hmm. The call did not go well. After suggesting for the second or third time, Mm -hmm. because this this has become a line with her. At fundraisers for fun, Mm -hmm. that this this Muslim-American congresswoman, her colleague at work— is a terrorist. And, um, you know, Al Franken was on CNN yesterday mm-hmm. saying, I, I can't imagine any other workplace in the world. You go to HR, say, uh, HR comes over and says, Bob, did you say that Mary was a jihadist on television? <laughs> did you go before some of our fundraising uh, sources and say some of our, our, our revenue sources and call one of your colleagues, a jihad, you know, brigade or the, the jihad squad. Did you do that? Uh, Why would you ask such a question? You know, Mm -hmm. did you make a video and publish it with one of your colleagues being murdered in anime? You know, it's just a Bob, joke. did you do that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They'd be out on their ass. And so there's there's apparently a club, Drift Glass, <laughs> yeah. where some of these things are allowed to just continue. And mm-hmm. uh, it's it's uh, very, very sad. But I'm well, very proud of Ilan Omar for, you know, and, and as you said to me yesterday, Mm-hmm. If we had an OAN or a Newsmax, we could just run that voicemail 24-7 for six months. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And say, if... here's how Republicans think. This is what this is how Republicans talk to one another. Mm-hmm. This is your Republican neighbor 
calling a woman and talking to her this way. I hope you're proud of, well, of your party. And I, I cast my mind back mm-hmm. to the 2015 slash 16 presidential election, where it turns out that Donald Trump's campaign CEO was a white supremacist. Yeah. And that's just a fact. That's a fact. He hired this person because they were a skinhead racist scumbag. That's why he hired them, because those are the people that he likes and wants to hang out with and trust to run his campaign. And Hillary Clinton pointed out, the Clinton campaign pointed out that, hey, he hired a white supremacist Mm -hmm. to run his fucking campaign. Mm -hmm. And the story from Meet the Press was both sides race to the bottom. Racing to the bottom, really. And nobody took a, you know, a bag of walnuts to Chuck Todd's head and said, Chuck, let me explain to you and every syllable you're going to feel some walnuts coming upside your head to explain to you <laughs> the difference between a person who hires a racist and the person who points out, hey, maybe hiring racist is a bad idea. Because in Chuck Todd's Beltway media world, they're just the same. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and it is it is beyond, um, way beyond, it's decades beyond the point where this is um, a toxic problem that will destroy democracy. It's yeah. way too late to fix this. It's just what we have left is pointing it out. And and Ilhan Omar did exactly the right thing. Yes, she did. She simply took it right to them in an open microphone where the reporters are sitting there and said, listen to this. Mm-hmm. And force them. But that's the thing. You have to force them mm-hmm. to report the story because the story they want to report so badly is, you know, is that Both Barack sides. Obama yeah. and, and some asshole cop, you know, got their, their signals crossed. So they're going to have a beer summit because both sides were really, you know, out of line. Yeah. And both sides were uh, – because that's all they know how to do. That's what they were hired to do. That's what they were, they were bred that's to do. what management do. tells them to do every yeah. day. Yeah. And if they don't do it, they're out on their ass like, mm-hmm. like David Gregory. So that's why understanding why the media is broken mm-hmm. and why we can't fix it. It can't be fixed by us from the outside. It will never be fixed by us. The only solution is one that's just going to take a long time and a lot of money, which neither of us, we, which we don't have, which mm-hmm. is building a liberal media infrastructure that can pound this message home with as much ferocity and velocity as Fox News pounds the lies home. Right, right. Um, Drift Glass, when when we get to uh, my interview with Junior Dude, yes, um, I try to bring up Adam Kinzinger. Uh-huh. And the fact that Adam Kinzinger is not running in 2022 for uh-huh. his new district uh, means uh, Junior Dude just goes, yeah, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. want to talk about him because he's not going to be a congressman yeah. in, in 18 months. But uh, you listened to Adam Kinzinger this week, didn't you? I did. I did. And, and the idea of Junior Dude just taking this pawn off the board. No, we're not he talking did. about him anymore. He took it off the board. He it's did. off the board, Mom. You'll and hear no, it. You'll hear yeah. it. <laughs> Um, no, yeah, well, you know, I, I have make it no secret that I listen to a lot of podcasts, a wide variety of podcasts. I don't listen to extreme right wing podcasts. I don't listen to, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't listen to the Sean Hannity show, even though right. it's broadcast on my radio every day where I live. <laughs> I do not listen to the Sean Hannity show because I know what they're going to say. There's no mystery involved there. I learn nothing from them, but I do listen to a, a, what I believe is a pretty broad spectrum of political podcasts. Um, and I have uh, started listening to sampling every now and then. Uh, Joe Walsh talking to people. This is, by the way, this little riff coming up is not about Joe Walsh. Okay. Uh, it's it's right. what this interaction reveals to me, and it it opens up into a broader topic, which is uh, so. This week he's interviewing Adam Kinzinger, which was pretty awful. I it's straight down the board, but it got me thinking that maybe it's time to talk about why why these handful of goofs who are finally either kicked out of the party or left or whatever can never ever bring themselves to pull up their big boy pants and join the Democrats. It's just, it's the, the whole thought sickens them. It yeah, horrifies but class, them. Do you listen to the Steve Bannon podcast? Only when I'm listening to Hal Sparks talk about the Steve Bannon <laughs> podcast. And, and then I believe Plaza I walk applause. past, I walk past and say, turn that shit down um, <laughs> and then go make a sandwich or something. Um, so during this conversation, which again is awful, you shouldn't listen to it. It's dumb. Uh, but Adam Kinzinger openly laughs at the suggestion that um, he should in any way join the Democratic Party. He said, no, I'm a Republican. I'm a Republican. I'm a conservative Republican. I, you know, the idea that he would ever become a Democrat is, is just ridiculous. 
Um, and he says shit like, you know, the Democrats are just five years behind where the Republicans are, you know, just five years away. They're just as bad. They're just a little behind the curve because that both siderism that he learned from Chuck Todd and, and mm-hmm. other people is what defends him from having an indefensible political ideology. And the Democrats are crazy and reckless for even proposing anything like a Build Back Better bill during these inflationary times. Blue during these inflationary yeah. times. And, and, you know, three years ago, five years ago, it would have been during these deficit times. During time of war. Yeah. During time it, of whatever. Yeah. yeah. And, and then Joe Walsh complimented him on his principled stance against voting rights. Because Adam Kinzinger, as you know, voted against voting rights. Wow. Adam Kinzinger is no fucking hero. He's a Republican yeah. who finally his gag reflex kicked in. So because all of them still believe in the conservative project and the only tangible difference between them and the Trumpers is that they want to go back to not saying the crazy racist shit out loud. Right. That's the only difference right. between them. The well, rest they, of the want, party, they want that cocktail party Republican, which is Kuth. At right. the golf club, right? Yeah. They don't They don't care. I mean, the one thing you learn when you study conservative history at all is that they entirely depend on a racist, homophobic, xenophobic, stupid base to win elections. Mm-hmm. Without stupid racists, they would never win another election. And everybody on the right knows it. But the problem, they always have this eternal problem is how do you keep them voting for us and keep pandering to them without saying this shit out loud? You know, how do we get away with pandering to the racists, pandering to the, the bigots and, and continuing to tell them their paranoia is patriotism and not have that show up in The New York Times? Mm-hmm. And the answer is, well, you have a thin coating of respectable Republicans at the top um, who who simply deny it's, it's happening at all. Or if it's happening, Democrats are just as bad. Mm-hmm. So the idea that there's any distinguishable difference between Adam Kinzinger and the rest of the GOP is ridiculous. It's just that he wants the crazies to shut up. Mm-hmm. And the crazies are like, no, shit, we're out of the cave now. Mm-hmm. We love mm-hmm. this stuff. We, and this is why they're, they're so energized. They're, they're finally right. allowed to loosen their pants after a Thanksgiving dinner and say, I love this shit. Let's well, keep and at, Marjorie, let's... <laughs> I have to confess that I heard yeah. a moment of Marjorie Taylor Greene on the Stephen K. Bannon podcast uh-huh. saying... I don't think they realize that we, meaning her wing of the party, we are the Republican majority. We yes, are the are. ones that run the party. And it's like, they, oh, there's a real moment of clarity there because yes, yes, she's absolutely. right. <laughs> she's absolutely right. And this is something that liberals have been saying for decades. And yeah. this is the reason liberals are not allowed on television and liberals are not right. allowed to say this on, on you know, the Bulwark podcast mm-hmm. because it completely screws up their theory that suddenly the po- party spontaneously lost its mind. In 2016, and nothing they did before that has any bearing on what happened today. So my question that that comes up when I listen to things like this is not the TikTok of the bad things they say or the dumb things they say, but what is the conservative project? What is it about that that binds all of these people together and makes the idea of siding with Democrats just so sickening to them, so horrifying to them? What is the, and this is how I framed it in my mind, the conservative operating system? Mm-hmm. What's the OS that all these people share? Everyone from Liz Cheney to Mitch McConnell all share the same operating system. They're all different apps, but they all have the same operating system. So what's the operating system? And you have to start with religion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That there's a special providence or a force of history or evolution, if you're a libertarian or whatever, which has given America a special destiny. America has a special purpose, Blue Gap. manifest destiny. Uh-huh. Just, just like again. the jerk. Yeah. Yeah. We have a special purpose. <laughs> and we must discover our special purpose. And, and sort of know what the special purpose is. God has a plan for America. And therefore, any attempt to meddle with God's plan is doomed to failure. And worse, it will backfire and make things even worse. Uh, that's why Reagan said government is the problem. Mm-hmm. Any attempt to meddle or screw with the, the natural order of things is is doomed and it will produce horrible uh, backfire results. Now, in order to protect God's plan from meddling, the country must be ruled by an aristocratic hierarchy of conservative Christian white men because they're the ones who know what's going on. And to them, all things are permitted because they're the ruling class and that's that's how things must be. And 
it's the ruling class of conservative Christian white men versus the meddlers, the one who people who want to tamper with the plan. And the meddlers are anyone who wants to change the status quo in any way. That's why they're called conservatives. They want to conserve things. They want pe- nothing to change. Anything that changes is bad. So anyone who wants to expand voting rights is the enemy or guarantee civil rights is the enemy or protect woman's autonomy over her own body is the enemy or provide for the poor is the enemy or to ensure that people have like, let's say, affordable health care or clean air or clean water by government mandate. All those things mark you as the eternal enemy of God's plan. Now, those beliefs are all hardwired into all conservatives. Now, those in the brain cast, those people up there at the top, the George Wills and the Tom Nicholses and the and the, the thinkers, the Bill Crystals in the party, they understand those beliefs explicitly, which is why they're adamant that Democrats uh, must let them run the show. All the folks who've been kicked out of the party or, or walked out of the party all agree that Democrats need to shut up and sit down and let them run things because they're aristocrats. They believe God wants them to be the shot callers the bosses, the people who are steering the great ship of state. So since they've been kicked out of the GOP, Democrats need to shut up and sit down and let them run things. And that's why they get really, really mad when we tell them, no, you can't, (laughs) because they're they're the monarchy. How dare you suggest we shouldn't run things? And those in the lower castes, the the, the base, the dum-dums, the racists, they've absorbed all this through osmosis. Through decades of soaking in right-wing hate radio and Fox News, they they sort of believe this stuff. That they might not have it all explicitly thought out in their minds, but they really believe that the left is the enemy, always, eternally. Um, that left must be destroyed, always. You can't compromise with anyone on the left, always. And that white men should run things. I mean, they, they all believe that. So here's the thing. Back... When I was at Columbia College, our department had around 400 computers, half of which were Windows and half of which were Macs. And the Windows machines were constantly picking up viruses that would just bounce off the Macs because the Macs were running a completely different operating system. And this is my analogy for what's happening to the GOP. Trump swept to power on the right because his appeal was perfectly tailored to the conservative operating system. Now, you can call him a virus, you can call him an app, whatever you want to call him, but his appeal would bounce right off the Democratic Party because his appeal mm-hmm. was to nativism, to to uh, uh, nostalgia for a time that never was, to this period of white people, to shutting down the border, and to blaming everything on the left. And that is the conservative operating system. And it's all part of a plan. It's all part of God's great plan. And this, in my opinion, is also why the Lincoln Project consistently failed to deliver on any of its promises, but it keeps chugging along. They keep getting money from God knows where because they fundamentally do not understand the Democratic Party for which they now claim to be working or leading or advocating. They really do think that the shit that they pulled to get stupid racists to the polls would work to get Democrats to the polls. Yeah, And it yeah. didn't. It just didn't because that's all they know how to do. Well, and that that virus analogy works very well when you talk about foreign interference in our elections and what they found out on Facebook, particularly in trying to tailor messages to Republicans about with disinformation. Right. Whereas when you went to liberal Facebook pages, someone would immediately fact fact check you in the comments and it was over. Right. (laughs) Argument ends. And so the virus would bounce right off. You could not. Uh, plant disinformation. Uh, you can't plant disinformation on a liberal Reddit website because someone will flatten you immediately. Yeah. And well, so that's that's it. Yeah. And that's why debating conservatives is essentially futile. Yeah. Because it doesn't, I mean, as I personally experienced, it doesn't matter how many times you prove that what they believe in this one case is a lie. Because yeah, the next liberals coming. are just as bad, Drift Glass. <laughs> liberals are just as bad, and liberal fact checkers are funded by the Soros organization. Yeah, and you yeah. can't. And even when you prove beyond any doubt, just change the subject, and then the whole system resets itself. And tomorrow, there's a new lie, yeah. because they are wired into this operating system that mm-hmm. truly believes that God has a plan for them, and the plan involves white men, white Christian running conservative men running everything. Yeah. Yeah. And anyone who says otherwise is automatically the enemy. 
Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and that's why forming an alliance with these people is insane. Because, yeah, yeah I'm sure Adam Kinsinger is going to be temporarily inconvenienced by not having a congressional seat. Mm-hmm. Because then he'll show up on MSNBC and he'll do fine. Right. But the reason we can't have an alliance with him is that he can't understand that he's the fucking problem. Mm-hmm. That his ideology, that his operating system is the problem. And his operating system, the conservative project, will always generate monsters. Because mm. what they believe in their deep in their hearts is fundamentally anti-democratic. And, they, and racist. Yep. And racist. Yep. But they believe in a theocracy. Now, they can call it whatever they want, but they believe God intends them to rule. And anything that stands in the way of that is bad. That is the definition of a theocracy. And, and the conservative operating system will always produce these results. Mm-hmm. And that's why it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't but matter what Liz Cheney says. tyranny for everyone, including white men. So, right. you know, that's that's the issue. Hey, Drift Class, we got to make leave room in this podcast for our moment with uh, Junior Dudes. So let's do News Roundup. Rock and roll, baby. All After right. you. Stacey Abrams has announced her second run for Georgia governor, and Simone Sanders has announced she's leaving her job as Kamala Harris's chief of staff in order to help Abrams win. To no one's surprise, this has been widely reported in conservative media as Kamala Harris drives out good people and Dems collapsing. I will point out to you again that <laughs> uh, in Georgia municipal elections this past month, uh, Georgia Democrats flipped over 35 seats. Yeah. Uh, and that's because Stacey Abrams wasn't governor. She had time on her hands. She was, you mean she wasn't going on Bulwark podcast bitching the no. Democratic Party and she, sucks? She had time on her hands because she'd been cheated out of the governor's office. Uh-huh. And uh, she went out and registered voters and got her people to the polls. So, honest, you know, honest, in if, local elections. If, if, if my future is governed if i have to look up and see um simone sanders and stacy abrams running my country and that Kamala is a future Harris running your country yeah. i can confidently hand off this country to the next generation well, you guys <laughs> this is awesome just calm down let them run things for a couple hundred years and everything will work out yeah that is the, a future the problem, the problem that i have with that statement is let because we're not letting them do anything oh, that's they're right. leaders and let me put it so... this way if my future looks like them uh-huh. You're i'm good. a happy guy i'm a happy guy i'm thrilled i'm thrilled with that future and a science fiction guy you know science fiction is 90 percent dystopian so i like a nice utopian vision of the future for for our kids and for everyone's kids um today the biden administration announced that health insurers must cover the cost of at-home covid testing for those not covered by private insurance they will make available free tests at thousands of locations like rural clinics and community health centers for folks to pick up and test at home. It's a big fucking deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. According to former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, who says one thing on Fox and one thing in his book, Mm -hmm. um, but in his book, he says Donald Trump tested positive for the coronavirus three days before his first debate against Biden in 2020 Mm -hmm. and lied about it. Uh, as part of his book promotion strategy, I, I think he's going to sell as many books as Chris Christie. Maybe, uh, maybe twice as many. I don't know. Maybe 4,000. <laughs> I don't know. Mark Meadows also agreed to cooperate with the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Uh, Trump called it fake news. And, and uh, you know, Mark Meadows went on Fox and said, oh, yeah, fake news. That's right. So I wonder if he's going to show up in the uh, in, at Congress with a book display. Yeah. And you know, sign copies. <laughs> sign copies um, for all the members of the committee here. Yeah. As you as we've already mentioned, as of this podcast, the Supreme Court appears likely to uphold a Mississippi law that bans almost all abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. The first confirmed US case of the coronavirus Omicron variant was detected in California. The CDC says the fully vaccinated traveler who returned to California from South Africa on November 22nd has mild COVID. 19 symptoms. He is uh, separated from other people. N- other people around him did not catch it. Um, he is improving. And uh, there have been some Israeli studies as well showing that vaccinated people seem to be getting a mild uh, illness from this. So we're hopeful that this is not 
uh, at, as big a deal. And we encourage you to get vaccinated and get your booster shots. It's time we're, to we're do that. We're both boosted. You know, Charlie Pierce got his booster yesterday. So come on, people. Oh, if Charlie come on, Pierce. People. Come on, people. Um, the House Freedom Caucus. What a name. What a name. Uh, is urging Mitch McConnell to force a government shutdown in an effort to defund the Biden administration's vaccine mandates. God. 52% of 18 to 29-year-olds believe that American democracy is either in trouble or failing. And this is another opportunity to mention Junior Dude, who deleted the news app from his phone yesterday because of anxiety. Yeah, a, and, a great uh, idea. We we encourage that for now because... Well, uh, Being constantly inundated with it is not helpful. And what we, the same advice we offer each other and offer at home is the same advice we put on this podcast, which is chop wood, carry water. Do what you can, where you can, find something tangible you can do with your time Mm -hmm. to make the world around you a better place. Postcards to voters right now, or at least the most recent time I signed up for it Mm -hmm. was uh, encouraging Florida voters to sign up for voter by mail, vote by mail, Florida Democrats to vote by mail. Um, The places where we can ask voters to register for vote by mail is a really positive thing to do. It is. Um, And so just chop wood, carry water. Absolutely. Uh, This week, Germany announced a nationwide lockdown for the unvaccinated. Good for them. NBC is reporting that Georgia election workers are suing noted wingnut conspiracy puke funnel, the gateway pundit. Go ahead and Google stupidest man on the internet. I dare you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Over its campaign of lies, election workers Ruby Freeman, a retired 911 call center worker, and her daughter, Shay Moss, allege in the lawsuit that Jim and Joe Hoft, twin brothers who operate and write for the Gateway Pundit, conducted a campaign of lies that instigated a deluge of intimidation, harassment, and threats that has forced them to change their phone numbers, delete their online accounts, and fear for their physical safety. Mm-hmm. Uh, people push their way into their home and trying to do a citizen's arrest because Gateway Pundit decided to publish these poor women's names and lie about them for Donald mm-hmm. Trump. Yep, and if that's and not they illegal. should be sued out of existence. I will miss you, Gateway Pundit, from the standpoint of poking fun at you. Mm -hmm. But you're a danger to democracy and you should go. You know what? I will take a boring life that is gateway pundit free over an exciting life that's full of gateway pundit insanity. (laughs) Bullshit. Every day of the week. (laughs) Every day. Um, Well, they're just, they are just an an outlier in terms of how awful they are. Like, you know, like Steve Bannon. There are just some pimples that are just ragingly infected on the internet. And these are one of them. And as as we discussed earlier in this podcast, the ratchet is always further to the right. It never mm-hmm. is, you know. But you know what? Let's be a little more reasonable today. No, 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 yeah. no, no. Our the the mob of of mopes and and morons who listen to us will not accept a reasoned approach to govern them. We mm-hmm. have to keep pushing further and further right. So they do, and until they're stopped, and I mean stopped hard, they're going to keep doing it. Uh, this week, Market Watch has a long article entitled The Good News About the Economy That You're Not Hearing Enough About. The recovery from the recession has been remarkably strong. The U.S. recovery is all the more extraordinary because it's so unusual. The U.S. is the only leading advanced economy to have exceeded its pre-pandemic levels, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. In fact, data from the most recent quarter shows that the real GDP, which is the GDP adjusted for inflation, is around 13% higher than the end of the COVID-19 recession. What's even more noteworthy is that we are recovering much quicker in comparison to the our two most recent recessions. At the end of 2008 recession, it took 66 months or 5.5 years to get to around 13% of its end of recession levels. At the end of the 2001 recession, it took 51 months or more than four years to get to that point. The unemployment rate, which reflects those not working but available and actively looking for work, has declined quickly and much faster than predicted. Last month, the unemployment rate fell to 4.6%, two years ahead of what the Congressional Budget Office had forecasted. The economic recovery is thanks in part to intentional fiscal policy, specifically the American Rescue Plan, 
which ensured the mistakes of the past were not repeated. Child poverty has also been cut nearly in half thanks to the child tax credit payments. Since March 2021, when the American Rescue Plan was passed, 4.3 million more people have found employment. Wages and real disposable income are up, especially for low-wage workers who are disproportionately women and people of color and who've experienced consistent wage growth since April 2021. In other words, bad news for Joe Biden. Bad news for Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Paul Krugman is slamming his hands on the desk and saying, thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Yeah. And you know what? I've been telling you this for the past three recessions. If we had an actual liberal media, uh huh. You know, this would be the story every day, all day long. Imagine well, and the a- other thing about all of this recovery, though, and compared to other countries, especially, mm-hmm. is how easy it is for Americans to get vaccines. Yeah, absolutely. And we're not sharing. We're we're protecting the patent, and mm-hmm. we're you know. It, it's fine for us because we get to get the vaccine for free. Right. That's right. Other countries don't have that access. And that is a moral failing on the part of the United States of America. And, and it's also stupid. That. Yeah. Because it's also, I mean, it is clearly a moral It's how failing. you get an Omicron va- That's variant. That's exactly right. Hello. <laughs> you you want to you stop the variants, then stop the entire spread of the vaccine or spread of the, spread of the virus. Stop yeah. it everywhere possible. Um. But, you know, but we and, yeah, we have learned the lesson of the past. The Biden administration has and are doing yeah. all the right things. Pumping and we ha- mo- printed money into the economy yeah. works. And yes. we're, we're using science to solve problems, mm-hmm. which is sounds very enlightenment to me. Uh, well, I know that and makes... we're using self-interest as well. I mean, when yeah. we look at this, this issue with, I don't know if you saw what, I, I believe he's Israeli. Um, the uh, chairman of Hasbro was on TV yesterday. He met with the White House and said, oh, no, supply chain problems are all over. I've got all my stuff off the yeah. boat and it's all oh, on yeah. the shelves. Everybody can get a Barbie doll. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, it's like. What about the Legos? Yeah, no Legos yeah, are no, covered. Got there. plenty of we Legos. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah. yeah. And they applied, as you said, I think a couple weeks ago. You know, fines if you if your stuff is sitting on the on the dock, uh-huh. you're going to pay an extra tax on it. Oh right. no, oh, I'm not oh, okay. You mean it's going to affect my shareholders? Get that stuff moving, right? Uh-huh. And they it was to their interest to hire people at higher wages to get stuff moving. Yes. So all it takes is a little bit of a government boot in the ass every now and then. Yeah, and leadership to make them do the right thing. And leadership and the availability of uh, all the, you know, all the bounty that this country has and all the mm-hmm. scientific expertise that it has. So that's not something that you hate and mock and fear. I mean, this is why we're called progressives. We believe in progress. We believe in science. We believe in helping people who who need help. Mm-hmm. And we believe in using government to do those things. And, and, and I'd also like to applaud another congresswoman named Lauren, not not the... Not the garbage one, but Lauren Underwood. Underwood Yeah. Is uh, our Illinois congresswoman. She's not my congresswoman. I wish she was, but she's um, in another district in Illinois. And uh, Joe Biden signed part of her momnibus actions this week. In Mm -hmm. particular, I mean, there are just certain places where the federal government can govern its own activities. And she was able to get. Birth equity, the idea of um, pregnancy and birth, childbirth outcomes among African-American women is much lower than white women. And, uh, you know, black women are dying in childbirth and and dying while pregnant. And and it's horrible. And uh, the the first bill, the one that she was able to get passed, a lot of what she's doing is in the Build Back Better program. But. What she was able to get passed and what Biden signed this week has to do with VA hospitals. And you don't think about it, but there is a very large number of women veterans under 40 out there today. Uh huh. And because of that, they are in, you know, reproductive age range and want to have children. And we want those pregnancies to be healthy and safe. And so 
the VA hospitals being given the funds and the ability and the directive to go looking for racial equity and desirable outcomes for pregnancy and childbirth across the board is a really positive thing. And Joe Biden signed that law. He did. This week from an Illinois congresswoman named Lauren Underwood. And we're very proud. Okay. Yes. And welcome to Illinois. Really, if you're welcome if you're looking Illinois, for a place to land, man, I tell on you. On that note, <laughs> uh, I recorded this interview with Junior Dude on Zoom. So the sound quality, it's in mono and the sound quality is a little bit lower than what we do. But uh, I'm grateful that we're able to do it. And uh, here it is. Hi, Junior Dude. Hey, Mom. Hi. So we're on the podcast. We're going to talk about... Um, redistricting specifically in Illinois. I wanted to talk to you about our own district, which is still called Illinois 13 with the new system. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That is correct. It's still Illinois 13, but Rodney Davis is not in our district anymore. He is our current congressman. And as of 20, what, 2023? Is that, how does it work? As of 2023, when the new Congress is sworn in, Okay, in January, uh, he's not gonna be. He will be representing another district. Another he, district, if he wins. He, yeah, if he wins that, which he probably will. You think he probably will? Okay, most likely, unless I never know with primaries, but right in Illinois, fifteen, there isn't another current congressman. There's Darren not, LaHood's in no. a different district, right? No, Darren LaHood's in the new sixteenth uh, right. district. Okay. Along with Adam Kinzinger, who's not running. So it's just Darren LaHood. It's just Darren LaHood. Now, getting back to Illinois 13, that is an open district now. Yes. All right. Correct. It is. Um, It seems to me that it's a more democratic district. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I would agree with that. Yeah. Why? Why would you say that? Because it is. It's. (laughs) It goes, it, it goes um, from being a uh, light-leaning Republican seat on 538. It goes from uh, Republican plus eight all the way to Democratic plus seven. So almost a complete 15-point uh, swing. A 15-point swing. They pack, packed in a lot of the uh, a lot of the urban areas down in the s- central southern part of the part of Illinois. So yeah. So from and this is a snake. This district is a snake. Uh, it, it, so it runs from East St. Louis all the way to Champaign. All the and way to it, Champaign, which is many miles away. <laughs> it's a smaller area geographically than the previous. The current thirteenth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they've carved out Republican votes and given them to other pe- other people. Yep goes yeah and it really does pack in a lot of the cities mm-hmm. down in central south central illinois including uh east st louis like you said springfield uh decatur uh, and champaign so wow. those are educated urban voters we are in a d plus seven district that's what 538 calls us correct rodney davis is in the 15th district now he's our yep. old congressman Yes. Illinois 15th wraps itself around the 13th district, literally. Or, or, or another way you could put it is that the 13th uh, cuts into the 15th. It, yes. uh, it does. Uh, yeah, it almost slices it. Almost cuts it, it in half. half. Illinois 13th, our district, it, you mm-hmm. said was D plus seven. Correct. Rodney Davis's new district, Illinois 15, is R plus 42. Yes, it is. That seems ridiculous to me. Oh, they're packing all the Republican votes into, into one district. As, in into, district. Into as few districts as possible. Yeah. So actually and three. There's three Republican districts. Three Republican now. districts. Solid and the 15th, the 15th even isn't even the most Republican either. It That's, isn't? It isn't. No, it's that. Uh, honor goes to the uh, Illinois, the new Illinois 12, which is the mo- southernmost district. And that's all Illinois. the way down south, goes all the way down to yeah. Kentucky, the Kentucky border, right? Oh, yes, yes. It it makes up the entire Kentucky border. Uh, it, it goes 
as far north as as just adjacent to Terre Haute in Indiana. Oh yeah, okay. So it, it, it for reference, that's how far north it goes. And how how tilted is that toward the Republican Party? Uh, forty six points versus R just plus forty six. That's just versus ridiculous. Four, versus forty two for the fifteenth. But that's that's because there aren't a, really aside from maybe Carbondale, it's it's not and maybe Effingham too. It's not really doesn't really have any big cities. Uh, right. What I'm thinking about when I think about this, because there are some districts up in Chicago uh-huh. that are this lopsided for the Democrats. I look at the Illinois Seventh District, which is one of three that that have a large concentration of Black voters up in the Chicago yes. area. Funny that you mentioned the seventh. It, it, that's actually the most democratic of all the districts in uh, in this new map at, yeah. at seventy over at seventy. B plus points. seventy. So. See, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's it, but, well. Although that's I, I think because, it would be hard. I think it would be hard to carve up Chicago in a way where there there is no Republican district in Chicago. Period. There isn't no. a single one. No. So, no, and and we were looking at these before, um, you know, the Bobby Rush is an African American. His district is D plus forty one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robin Kelly represents the second district. Her district is D plus thirty seven. Um, mm-hmm. There's an open district in the third, which is white and Hispanic majority. Yeah, it's a second. They created a new um, second. Uh, majority Hispanic district because because of Chicago growing, has a significant a grow and a growing Hispanic of, population of Hispanic voters know. right so what do you think about now, that as opposed to redistricting by party do you think that districts should be carved out for um, ethnic and racial minorities well it sort of already is required by, via the Voting Rights Act that. Uh-huh that minority voters should have the opportunity to elect candidates of their choice proportionate to um, the population, how, yeah. proportionate to their percentage of the population within any given state. I'm okay. not okay. sure. I'm not sure entirely. I'm not sure how that exactly works. Well, it would, is, if, if the concentration of voters is Hispanic, it yeah. would, and you did redistrict it so that Hispanics can't be represented then, you then, then that would be a, then that would be a racial, racial, <laughs> racial minority or right? majority, right? You're, you, yeah, that would be a point racial is not to redistrict so that white people only win, and that's been going on for a long time. So yeah, that, I think that's a racial gerrymander, that. and that's illegal. That's right. illegal. Under, under you really have to look at it the opposite way. Which district did you say was competitive in terms of Republican the, versus Democrat? Is it the six? Uh, that, that, that would be the new uh, 17th district. Oh, uh, where Sherry Bustos. Where she was Sherry your Bustos congresswoman when you were at Augustana, right? Yes, correct, correct. And she actually came by my school one time and I actually got to ask her uh, questions. Oh, that's nice. What did you ask her? Do you remember? Uh, just about her stance on the war on drugs. And she kind of, she, she, she punched, she, she gave an answer that was safe. She gave a safe answer that was yeah. very... Uh, ambiguous. She she yeah. gave a very um, yeah ambiguous answer that was politically safe. I think. Okay. And, All right. Uh, but she's not running again, right? She's nope. retiring. She's retiring. Uh, the new seventeenth is, according to five thirty eight, the only real real competitive district in Illinois. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It has, but it has a leaning of Democratic plus four. So even there, a Democrat is favor to win in a neutral political environment. Right. So, but neutral political environment means not a wave election. N- yeah. And this is what, election. this is what I wanted to talk to you about in terms of um, Lauren Underwood in the 14th, uh-huh. because Lauren Underwood uh, is very popular among liberals. Uh, she beat out a incumbent Republican in 2018. Uh-huh. And uh, she's an African-American woman who's working on the Momnibus bill, which is about maternal health and making sure that Black women uh, have as much prenatal care. And there's a big problem with Black women dying both while pregnant and in childbirth at a much higher rate than white women. And so she's working on bills that will bring equity to health care for pregnant women. 
she is at D plus seven. Our district's at D plus seven. Cherry Bustos' district is at D plus four. The Newman Caston Illinois six is at D plus six. It seems to me that those districts could be vulnerable in a wave election situation where, like we had with the blue wave in 2018, where Democrats won 41 seats in the House, if we ever got a situation where Republicans were that popular, mm -hmm. uh, those D plus four and D plus seven, six and seven districts might flip. Might flip, yeah. Seems to me. Whereas a D plus 38 or a D plus 44, no. Would you agree with that? Well, I I would, and that's why I think that's why 538 uh, differentiates between the grays for or like the really competitive districts, mm -hmm. uh, the and then you get the light colors, you get the light blue, the light red, yeah, and right. and, and the, the solid um, blue and the solid and the red, solid blue, and yeah. what basically what the light the light colors are for districts that are. Uh, 15 points to one side or the other or below. Oh, okay. So, for example, uh, the, the the Illinois eighth district mm -hmm. is a Democrat plus 12 district, but because it's under 15 points, it's it's it is a competitive Democratic. It's leaning. District. It's leaning. Not it's, it solid. Leans, right. It yeah. leans leaning, but it's not solid by any okay. standard. And okay. Same same for. Uh, same for like light Republican districts uh, to yeah. competitive Republican districts. They're 15 points or below uh, in terms of competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, but then once you get to under five points, then it's a highly competitive district because yeah. any one party could win. Right. Either party right. Could win. right. And that's why D plus four isn't enough to make it comfortable for. A Democrat it a, running. Not, not, it's not fight. even a competitive Democrat. It's a highly, highly competitive district. Right. Highly competitive district. Right. So, um, but I was interested in the fact that with Lauren Underwood, who won her state, her, her district in 2018, which was a wave election, and mm -hmm. her uh, district at that point was R plus five. Mm -hmm. And she still won. She beat an incumbent Republican. Yes. And that, but that was a wave election. It was an yeah. anti Trump election. And so she won and then she held on to her seat in 2020. Mm -hmm. So, and I think because she works really hard for her district, I think that's why. But um, now, what, what has happened to her district under redistricting? Well, her old district was, well, according to 538, it was R plus three. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, her old district was basically the the way it looks looked like the outer ring Chicago suburbs yeah like the furthest out of the Chicago suburbs mm -hmm. but her new district still keeps some of those outer ring Chicago suburbs for example Joliet is right. entirely within the new 14th okay but well that's going to have African Americans in it too Joliet yeah. has African American voters but yeah. but it's pushed it, it's it, it pushed further south and west mm -hmm. um it's it's further southwest her old district it, it bordered wisconsin uh -huh. and okay. oh wow 14th, okay the new 14th doesn't do that the new 14th doesn't border wisconsin and it looks like the new 14th has more minority representation yeah. in it yeah it's and again, it's, it, it, what is the, the current board, what is the current leaning for her district it Illinois 14th. The, again, the current leaning was is Republican plus three, but under the new, her new district is Democratic plus seven. So she's going to be safer. Safer, but not, not entirely was. safe. Right, entirely but safer. Safe. They, they've moved more Democrats into her district. They've In tried to district. make it easier for her to- And they've, and they've moved more Republicans out. That's yeah. also- Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's not just about- Consolidating Democrats, Democrats it's moving, it's moving, it's moving Republicans, Republicans out. out. Yeah, and they really this map really does look like a um, farm fence around Republicans, putting wow. a fence around them and saying, "Okay, we're going to make your districts as Republican as we can by putting all the Republicans in there." 
Yeah, and, so and that makes your the surrounding Congress. districts much easier to win. But doesn't that also mean that crazy wackadoodle Republicans can get elected to those districts because they're going to win no matter if they win a primary, they're going to win no matter what? I mean, that is that that is true, but I don't really know what else you can do about that aside yeah. from making sure that there are as few of them as possible in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. So are you defending the Democratic gerrymandering map of Illinois? Um, I am and I'm not at the same time. Okay. Uh, and let, let me explain what that means. Under any normal circumstance, I would be against this because mm -hmm. I want, obviously I want uh, maps that are fair to everyone or as, or as much, many people as possible. Obviously mm -hmm. you're not going to have, you're never going to have like a completely fair map, but mm -hmm. you can have a map that's as fair as possible to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, so in that circumstance, I'm against this, but at the same time, uh, I realize that there, there are Republican states like Texas and North Carolina, uh, that have, uh, gerrymandered and there are other states too, that they've gerrymandered to, uh, make it beneficial for their voters and for their control of Congress as a whole. Yep. So anything that can be done to counteract that is a good thing. Thank you very much, Junior Dude. <laughs> thank you very much, Mom. All right. Thank you, Junior Dude. That was a great interview. Thank you Excellent. very much. Excellent. Very I, proud of you. I, you know, I, I kid because uh, he is so obsessed with this sort of thing, but I really do learn a lot. I mean, I do listen uh, attentively when he talks about the mechanics of, of politics and districting and things like that, because he really does know what he's talking about and he's really mm -hmm. good at it. So I'm very mm -hmm. proud of him. He's a, he's a map fiend. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he loves uh, knowing those districts and what they represent. So that's really fun. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Eloise. Eloise is a large, fluffy, and very serene cat. We think she might have a little bit of Maine Coon in her because she's kind of big. She also apparently controls access to the kitchen sink in her house. Yes. So, you know... You want the sink, you need to go through Eloise. Mm -hmm. And of course, Eloise eats freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cats will sit on the kitchen floor or at the edge of the kitchen sink and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can... <laughs> Olive just started walking to the food bowl as I was singing. Why? <laughs> I, I know that song. Know. Hey, it I know works, that people. song. <laughs> Attention, Democrats. Branding and repetition actually works. <laughs> Messaging. <laughs> Messaging. <laughs> you can visit Eloise at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty dog or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service Go Postal Unions letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag jail to joy. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us or five. You know, it's sure. coffee season. Yeah. We'll take, we'll take what we can get. <laughs> this is not charity. This is our job, and we love our jobs. So uh, please donate to the podcast. We appreciate it. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information, all of it is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and if you love this podcast... Number one, donate to the podcast. And number two, get someone else to listen to. Thank you so much for doing that. We love you. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties cannot wait for Stacey Abrams to be the governor of Georgia. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the wine and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. 
Professional F podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.